Hello, good morning. My name is Farah and I'm the marketing principal for HOK's London Studio. It's really good to have such a house full and just to see so many friends and acquaintances in the studio this morning. And so to our speaker, Gary's early influences shaped his love of both the arts and sciences. As a child, he often accompanied his engineer father under Aberdeen hospitals within Victorian ceramic tiled ventilation chambers. This experience provided an insight into how buildings operate. Coupled with the arts and science, his beloved sketchbook, and by studying history, physics, and maths, this naturally led Gary to study architecture. The appreciation of vernacular architecture is very much influenced by materials and complemented by the expression of engineering. And he was fortunate at the time to be taught by specialists covering the sciences, sociology, history, and physics of architecture. Gary received the British Gas Student Project Award in 1986 for a low energy house. And this was the moment when Gary thought about energy efficiency in terms of how to design and build a house and before climate change as a global issue became as topical and as urgent as it is today. Studying at Robert Gordon University for his first degree after parts one, two and three, he practiced both here in London and in Aberdeen. Gary was drawn into further studies and went on to study his MPhil in environmental design at Cambridge. He was very much focused on natural ventilation and post-occupancy evaluation. And this is when Gary was presented with two choices, either to stay at Cambridge for a PhD or to lecture at Robert Gordon University. Invited back to RGU, he was probably the only architect who could or was interested in teaching building physics. And that is where he taught as a studio tutor while studying for his PhD. Moving to Edinburgh University, Gary had hit 30 and was rather envious of his students returning from London, working on beautiful buildings. As you do, he handed in his notice without even having a job to go to and persuaded his newly wedded wife to follow him to London, promising her that the streets would be paved with gold. <laughs> Naturally, his wife was disappointed upon arriving in London. Gary has had a phenomenal career and portfolio, working at the award-winning Hopkins, Bennett Associates, and Wilkinson Air Architectural Practices. Bookending his career so far, Gary commenced designing the ecological restaurant in the park at St. James's Park and the now iconic and award-winning Gas Holders London at King's Cross for Argent. Throughout his career, Gary has headed sustainability up to whichever practice he has worked at trying to achieve a sustainable future for all building typologies. Gary's industry roles include visiting professor of sustainable architecture in Aberdeen, chair of the Soft Landings Bisria User Group from 2009 to 2016, after which he joined Reba Sustainable Futures Group and appointed chair in 2018. Gary has led the charge at REBA, drafting a suite of guidance which has culminated in the REBA 2030 challenge that was launched late last year. And many of the organisations being represented here this morning in the audience have signed up to this laudable challenge. And so, without further ado, I am delighted to introduce the formidable and exceptionally charming Gary Clark. Thank you, everyone. So embarrassing when you hear your history uh, sort of played back in that way, but, uh, but thanks very much uh, for it, and um, welcome to uh, HOK. Um, <clears throat> we're entering the, uh, a new decade. It's probably the most critical decade of uh, our civilization. Um, we've got 10 years to avert uh, what is going to be um, a crisis, uh, and obviously David Attenborough this morning was uh, 
was on the news saying exactly that. So, uh, so this talk really is a summary of actually the work I've been doing at uh, the RBA uh, to really sort of uh, map out the future, basically. What do we need to do when? And it starts now, so it starts uh, today. So let's have a recap of uh, how we got here. We've got 7.7 .7 billion people, and that's rising, uh, obviously, very fast. That collectively, we emit 37 billion tonnes of CO2 per year. A third of that globally is from buildings, uh, about 40% roughly in the UK. That's why it's so important that we take responsibility for this. Now, the Earth absorbs about half that CO2. Uh, that figure is debatable. Some say it's less. Uh, but ultimately, that's driving the problems of uh, what's happening today. Coupled with that, we've got this kind of unbalanced uh, triple bottom line. We're trying to kind of increase our global GDP of uh, last year was $80 trillion. Um, it's unbalanced. We've got to recollect that balance. Okay, we've got to kind of look at sort of GDP. We've got to look at it and not take it from the planet itself. The UN and the IPCC and the reports last year, and again, this is, this is, not, this is nothing new, uh, really summarize the kind of the key stark choices that we face uh, this year, and we need to make it this year. We've got a few scenarios there. We can see we're heading on a path if we do nothing to four degrees and plus. If we do 2% reduction per year as a planet, and we agree this at uh, the COP26 uh, this November, then we can achieve around about two degrees increase in global temperature. But if we attack, and then the UN and the IPC say, if we achieve a 7.6% reduction annually, then we can maybe achieve the 1.5 degree limit. Just for looking back at history, uh, we've only achieved that, uh, the four degree increase in temperature four times in half a million years. Uh, the climate was obviously very different. This time, it's a man-made disaster. The Committee of Climate Change, the kind of, this is the UK carbon budgets. We've done quite well, you can see from our 1990 benchmark, but that's predominantly from uh, changing from coal to gas, so let's not fool ourselves. Uh, but there's some good wins in terms of that. But you can see the line accelerating there, and um, I've got a meeting this afternoon with the Committee of Climate Change where we're going to sort of start uh, work on the sixth annual carbon budget for the government. And uh, I'll be saying we need to reduce further, we need to hit that 2050. But we've got to do it by including embodied energy materials as well. So for all our structural engineers in the, in the audience, that is absolutely critical. That's you at the forefront. But also we've got to deal with a policy for existing buildings. That's the elephant in the room. We must address it, and we must address it this year. With the uh, Architects Declare Group, uh, Climate Extension, external bodies, this external pressure is brought to bear. Internally, I've been obviously trying to kind of push the RBA as well. And I think this great, uh, the RBA this year declared an emergency. So that's, that's what's happened in 2019. And then with that, once you declare an emergency, then you've got to then think, well, how are we going to address it? And we can't hang about here. And so we started work. Uh, luckily, we were revising the plan of work as well. Uh, and that's the, uh, the work I've been doing. So I've been uh, authoring guides and so forth. A few have been uh, mentioned here. So in the middle there, we've got the 2030 Challenge, which was uh, launched in October in time for the Sterling Prize Award. Uh, and we'll come on to that later in the talk. Uh, and in December, uh, we actually uh, issued my guide on sustainable outcomes. And that's the kind of the DNA of a sustainable building and place. I think we can announce uh, that the RBA will be launching the new plan of work. And uh, part of that, we've got a sustainable overlay, which kind of goes with that. And we've also got a new plan for use. We've been talking about plan of work for 50 years, but very few architects have been talking about how to use and how to operate buildings. And that's going to change in a few weeks. All the guides are right back to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This is all 17 here. But behind the 17, if everybody goes behind that, there's about 300 metrics that uh, all they relate to. Clearly, that is very complicated, and we need to sort of discover that. But for, I was absolutely convinced for working professionals like ourselves, we need something very clear, very simple guides that we can deal with on a daily basis. So we've reduced the 17 down to 10 at a project level. There's 10 outcomes. And then we've reduced again further from the 10 to eight sustainable outcomes. We've tried to keep the names the same, uh, but inevitably we've kind of refined the kind of metrics and we are really trying to kind of create kind of key performance indicators that then summarize and, and as proxy for, for lots of other factors. 
For instance, you can see there that clean water sanitation and life below water in terms of the UN SDG is combined into what we call sustainable water cycle. I'm just going to go through each one very briefly. This is a quick sort of guide through it. If you want more detail, the Sustainable Outcomes Guide can be downloaded um, after the event. So first one is net zero operational carbon. And the metric there is well known. It's kilowatt hours per square meter. So you, 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 you look at energy first, then you do your carbon conversion. But really, there's no shortage of energy. Uh, the sun's there. It drives the wind, drives the waves, drives water. It's actually the problem is, is how do we harness the, uh, the energy and how do we conserve it and make best use of it? So the first thing is, in terms of the guide, is retrofit first. So you've got to think about that. So think about that moment when you're uh, approached with a new brief. Think about refurbishment at that first point. Then you think about passive measures. Again, using the building to do most of the work, the fabric of the building. Then you look at regenerative active systems in terms of thermal recovery, LED lights, and so forth. And then, only then, do you think about sort of the integration of renewables. Moving on to the next one, zero and body carbon. So this is the flip side that we're only starting to really look at in more detail. The metric here is kilogram CO2 per meter squared. Um, that's using a very much a, a, a RICS kind of sort of methodology. And what it comes down to, same thing again, retrofit. You've got to think about retrofit. That's the first moment. You've got to think about how we uh, make the best use of our available resources. But then we've got to learn the lessons, and uh, all of us have got to learn the lessons of vernacular architecture. Uh, we've got to think about using local materials, especially wood. And I know there's an issue, obviously, with the, the fire in terms of post grandfill But we've got to seriously consider this. Okay? We've got to use uh, local materials well. We've got to avoid waste. But we've also got to think about design for disassembly as well. And the Japanese temples, the shrines, there's still many of them that are rebuilt and repaired every 20 years. And some of them have been doing this for nearly 2,000 years. So we've got to learn those lessons. Moving on to sustainable water cycle. What this kind of comes down to really is we've got to look at sort of um, decentralizing and helping our infrastructure by capturing rain at a site level, at a building level. We've got to store this. The benefits are we reduce our use of uh, potable water use, and we help with the attenuation, helping to, to alleviate some of the problems of our infrastructure, especially in uh, flash floods as well. Moving on to sustainable conductivity and transport. The most sustainable journey that you can make is the one that you don't make. So uh, this is where kind of digital conductivity is so important. We've got to try reduce our amounts of, uh, of transport. And when we do, we've really got to be absolutely serious about creating sort of uh, journeys and the experience of the journey that is actually pleasant for cycling and walkers and not take your life in your hands on the streets of, uh, of London. And then this is before we actually think about electric vehicles as well. Now, the Committee of Climate Change, they've looked at the energy, potential energy. We need four times as much energy as we use now if we are going to uh, electrify all our vehicles. So clearly, we're not ready for it yet. Coming on to sustainable land use and ecology, this balance of actually using land wisely. So we've really got to sort of focus on actually the, the, the use of land, it's the retrofit of land, the brownfield land. And we've got to balance that. Wherever we come into a site, we've got to leave it in better shape than when we got it. We've got to make it more ecologically rich. And this is actually not about just green cover in terms of the London plan. We've got the green cover. We've got to add that biodiversity. And as the children here, we've got to add that productive landscape into whatever we do. Moving inside the building a little bit, so it's good health and well-being, and obviously this is very much high in the agenda of all of you, I'm sure, in your practice. The principle really here is um, we need that contact outside. We cannot seal buildings. And um, you know, it, it, the amount of times that, um, for very good reasons, that all my engineering colleagues advise me that we can't open a window, um, I think we've got to push back. And hopefully, with the, um, uh, the changing of our, our street patterns, we can actually have more of that natural ventilation in our buildings. This is Rathbone Square around the corner here. And it's about that contact, that deep contact to real vegetation, to real biophilia. Then it's about daylight. It's about indoor air quality. That's the, the kind of key factors in that one. We've got to remember that what we're doing is we're creating places and communities. This is what we do. This is our kind of core mission, I would say. And so the balance of this is the sustainable communities and the social value. Now, the uh, professor at um, Reading, Flora Samuel, is doing some fantastic work. We're working together. 
at the cost, at the added value of what we do, which is absolutely fantastic. And for me, there's no better example at uh, Granary Square for Argent, plug for Argent, but it you know, really is one of the best um, uh, public spaces, I think, in, in, in London for, for the last 100 years. I uh, spent many moments in between meetings um, with a glass of coffee, or maybe a glass of wine, <laughs> um, in between, but really enjoying the space and watching the families from the local communities come in and use that uh, through the summer holidays. It's absolutely fantastic place. So moving on to cost. Now this is the bit that sort of, um, as, a, as a, a green ambassador, uh, normally we shy away from cost, but this is gonna direct head on. Who pays? At the moment it's the planet, that can't go on. We've got to then push it back in. Now in terms of all our cost consultants in the, in the audience, friends, generally between five and 10%, but really, I mean, when I sort of meet any client, I argue, I say, well, give me a budget and I will attempt to do the best I can uh, in terms of sustainable future uh, within that budget. I think it should cost no more. Um, obviously with um, infrastructure, that's kind of a different issue. But really, if you look at the kind of sustainable outcomes, then you walk around this, you flip it around and each is actually heading in terms of an added value. One, we've got the operational energy, that's reducing the energy use of the building and the cost. In body carbon, the work of Simon Sturgis is showing actually if you reduce in body carbon, that reduces your cost of your building as well. Sustainable water cycle, reducing again costs of water. Then we come on to the conductivity, again reducing that kind of cost of travel for business. Then we've got sustainable land use, again you're adding value to that land. Good health and well-being, that's productivity, that's about health and well-being, it's about sort of um, uh, creating a, a fantastic place for, for people to work. And then sustainable communities, again, the added value, social value is absolutely extraordinary. And then finally, that life cycle cost. Uh, if you add all that together, I think five, 10%, if we can try and do that, we balance that with the, uh, the added value. So that's our kind of mission, really, in terms of our mission statement. How do we go about it? This is kind of, sort of the early example of this one. So this is gonna be released in a few weeks time. This is the plan of work, this is the sustainability overlay. And what we're saying is we're gonna map the outcomes and then we map through each of the stages and our overlay explains in great detail in terms of what you need to do when. And what it comes down to is we set our goals obviously in zero and one, then two, three and four, we're actually looking to, to integrate those strategies deeply into uh, the building. Then we monitor and review those um, through sort of four or five, through to the handover of the contractor. And then we validate and disseminate through that in terms of this five and six. And then this is where our plan for use comes in, is that we're mapping out what you need to do to be ready for handover of that building uh, where the, the client and the users are all ready for it. And then we actually then, and this is the big thing here, is the, um, our guide suggests quite strongly that architects and, and, architects and the design team we should actually carry out a post-occupancy evaluation at the end of defects period. This is a voluntary just now, but hopefully in a couple of years, that will be mandated for all architects uh, in terms of charter practices. And then finally, we get into the use, and this is where the plan for use comes in. And then finally, that POE is then fed back in, and that feedback uh, process uh, is absolutely critical. So how fast can we do it? So I'll take a moment of this graph. This is actually in the guide and the challenge as well. First thing really is, if we do nothing, it's a straight line. That straight line to four degrees plus. That is unlivable, absolutely unlivable. We've drawn the line in terms of UK government and many others that uh, we draw the straight line down to 2050. That's plus two. That is still double what we are now, and we see the problems that we've got around the world. So again, what we're saying in the RBA, and I firmly believe this, this is still unsustainable. We're picking up the UN guidance and the IPCC guidance here, is actually we need the trajectory to really go faster, and this is for new and deep retrofit buildings. We need to hit that 2030. It's absolutely critical that we, that we attempt to do this. And the reason is that we need to go, we can't build any new unsustainable buildings going forward because that 30 years is probably when we've got to deal with existing building stock. So it's incumbent on us to try and hit that. The challenge sets four of the major outcomes. We've got operational energy, embodied carbon, water use, and then we've got to be mindful of the unintended consequences on health and well-being. What we've done is we used industry benchmarks, and then what we're saying is really for operational carbon is it's a soft start. It's about 25% reduction this year uh, against benchmarks. 
2025 is when it kicks in. We need a 50% reduction by 2025 for new buildings and deep retrofit. And then in 2030, that's where we hit a 75% reduction. Now, the thing is, if you're in a rural or suburban situation, we can achieve net zero on site. But urban buildings like this, we've got to allow some sort of offsetting. And that's part of the thing I'll be asking the CCC to look at. We need a proper certified method of offsetting in the UK. This is the example of non-domestic, slightly different factors, but we'll be working with SIBSI this year uh, to then map out uh, the benchmarking for different sectors. Uh, but that's where we need your help to help with those benchmarking as well, to share data. So can we do it? I'm sure some of you are going, oh my goodness, this is, this is a bit of a challenge. And uh, you know, 2030, it's, it's, quite, it's quite soon. Can we, can we redo it? Well, Better Building Partnership think we can do it. They're uh, working with neighbors in Australia and that's going to be written into the design performance tool for the Better Building Partnership, in starting in London, and the pilot studies are actually done. What they've done in Australia, Melbourne, over a 16-year period, they've reduced their energy use by 75%. We've got 10 years, but if the Australians can do it, I think that we can as well. And the proof of that really is in our case studies. So the winner last year was 2019 Goldsmith Street. Again, that, that hits our kind of 2030 challenge head on. And that's part of the reason why it won the Sterling Prize. You know, 90% reduction in energy. Uh, and, um, and then we can see that in terms of the embodied energy almost hitting that. Uh, and this was done for 1,800 pounds per square meter. So this whole thing about it costs more and we can't afford it. There's no excuses really with this now. Moving up to actually smaller scale, just to beer architects, this is a fantastic example. With PV, sorry, the previous scheme was without renewables. This is with renewables, photovoltaics, and this actually exports electricity to the grid. And obviously it helps the power of the owner's electric vehicle as well. This is extraordinary, we can do this now. Moving into higher complexity of larger non-domestic buildings, I would say the enterprise center here with Archetype and BDP, again, this achieves that, um, that 70 uh, kilowatt hours per square meter, you know, 70% reduction, that's, that's almost there, but that's without major renewables as well. Moving back to CL again, we've got Keensham, uh, AHR and Max Fordham. And again, this achieves a very good sort of rating, 50% without renewables. So you can achieve that, that's 60%. But that's a complex uh, building. And then for me, the final example here was uh, the Sterling Prize many years ago. But this is the Everyman. This is probably the best performing and the best looking, actually, theater in the world. And this achieves, uh, you can see there, a 70% reduction in energy with no renewables. This is just with natural ventilation, all those principles that I learned as a kid. Uh, this is it. This is where it all kind of comes together. So what happens now? Really, when you go back to your office and you consider what you're doing, and I'm, I'm sure it's a self-selecting group here. You're all here to hear about this. But really, there's absolutely critical things we need to change in behavior and attitudes now. And really, I'm looking to you to be the leaders in your field and in your practices to, to achieve this. So we summarize what these are, and then these are at the back of the 2030 challenge. Well, the first thing is, if you're a consultant, phone your client of your existing buildings, help them to tune up their buildings. And the research shows in terms of post evaluation, you can achieve a 20% energy saving and carbon saving by helping your client to tune up the buildings. That's 20% we can do now. So phone your client. If you're a client, phone your design team. I'm sure they'll be willing to, to speak to you. But we've got to do it in a no-blame culture. We can't blame each other. We've got to work together to, in order to solve this. We've got to target net zero whole life carbon, and that's by prioritizing deep retrofit at a certain point. So you've got to consider that in terms of the, when the projects are coming in, you've got to consider, is it a new building, is it a deep retrofit? Okay. Uh, Steve Tompkins clearly said to me, he was, he's actually pledged that he will not do any new buildings himself. He will actually only do uh, retrofit buildings. And within that, we've got to target decade for non-domestic buildings and a passivized performance level uh, for, for domestic buildings. We're going to look at 20, 40% reduction in water use. These are eminently achievable targets. We're going to target a well-building standards or equivalent in terms of our indoor health and well-being. And we've got to target that significantly enhanced ecology and green cover in our buildings. And then finally, really is, uh, if you can all go away, have a look at the 23rd challenge and sign up. We need that level of uh, the entire industry to get behind this. 
uh, to then change uh, behaviors. So really, a few final words really for myself, is that we have entered this year as a point of no return. This is it. This is, and this is the leadership here. Everybody in the room here, you're here because hopefully you're, you're really kind of part of the, the movement. You're going to take this back. You've got to show leadership. Hopefully what I've shown in a quick talk today and the guides that will kind of be released and have been released. So it gives you the, uh, the understanding, a common understanding of what sustainability is. Hopefully it's clear, measurable targets. There's a process there. It's all mapped out very clearly. And there's inspirational examples. So we have got to match those inspirational examples. And that's our challenge. Thanks very much. So anyway, yeah, so questions. We've got one there. Hi, Maria Smith, Web 8 Engineers and the RIBA. I was wondering if you could say something about striking the balance between operational and embodied carbon, because often, for example, if you sort of stick loads of PVs on something, then in order to reduce or even make its kind of operational carbon negative, um, you're massively increasing its embodied carbon. And it's just, where do we think we should be striking that balance? And yeah, how do you think we should show the metrics together? I mean, there are different ways. You can stick it all in a pie chart. You can measure it kind of cumulatively. And what do you think the best ways are of sort of helping us to make that decision? OK, thanks very much, uh, Mir. So, so basically, this is um, the concept of whole life carbon. And uh, we've got to balance up in terms of uh, the, the trying to sort of reduce operational energy with the embodied energy. And what the principle really is, is, is instead of we're very used to monetary paybacks periods for, uh, for products. We've got to think about the carbon payback. Will it pay back in its lifespan? And will it add that value? That's for me, that's, that's the bottom line. And then the next thing really is, is you've got to prioritize that thing in terms of the passive envelope. So the, the, the building of the material, that's, that's, that's a kind of primary thing. And then what you do is if you do that well, then you reduce then how much renewables you do need. So again, that's that balance. So I would say, but it's been mindful. So the, 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 the main sort of example of this is, to go triple glazing or not, okay? For me, uh, in terms of looking at the analysis, for me, I still go for triple glazing. I wouldn't go for quadruple. I think that's overkill. Uh, but again, that's that fine line. But all it comes down to is that when you're on your projects, you've got to look at that balance. And, and that's why, in terms of the London plan, we're asking for a whole life carbon analysis of key components. And that's where that will tell you what that is. So you've got to balance both, but you're absolutely right, Miriam. So. My name's Shirley Waldron from Delva Patman Redler. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, it's about the new EU Commission, a woman called Ursula van der Leyen, and she talked about our man on the moon moment, and um, I saw you had the iconic image of Earth rising from the Apollo 8 voyage, amazing. She talked about us changing our measurement of the economic health of a nation from GDP and that eternal quest for growth. Um, and I wonder if, if that's something you're able to influence in your conversations with government. Yes, I, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm a realist as well. So um, yeah, I will state the case. I mean, it's basically that the, uh, it, the, the economy is unbalanced. We're taking from the planet. Um, and then the examples we can give, this is, this is only by examples that we can demonstrate that it is possible, the art of the possible. But you, you, you're absolutely right. It's basically, we've got to move beyond the kind of the, this narrow defines of uh, where we are in terms of economics. And it's really the cost of carbon that comes into that. Uh, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Annika, who's head of sustainability in, in the States, she's uh, presented in New York. Now, New York is now um, starting to fine building owners uh, $260, $268 per ton if they don't meet uh, New York targets. Um, so I think I'm going to sort of suggest that. I think that's basically where we should sort of go. And that will drive, that's driving change now in New York. Other cities in the States are really leading that, despite of obviously a certain gentleman. Um, so yeah, so that's basically what we need to, what we definitely need to do, and I will make that case. Thanks. So. I'm Annalie Toaster with the Better Buildings Partnership. Um, and I was curious if you could talk to the skills gap in the industry, because as we know, a lot of property owners, architects, occupiers all want the same things. But, you know, as we've shown through our design for performance pilot, 
it's not actually being implemented in practice. Um, and so how can we, as architects, as construction firms, come together and actually meet this challenge by having people upskilled? How, how are we going to do that? OK, really good question. Thanks very much for asking that. So there's a couple of things here. So the, um, I think the first thing to say is, the, uh, is, I forgot to mention, it's the stick. So the carrot stick. So, so um, what's going to happen, uh, which I forgot to mention, the 2030 challenge, is the awards for RB are going to align with the 2030 challenge. So there's an article I've, I've uh, contributed to, and it's coming out in RBA Journal next month, um, where it outlines how we're going to do that. And so uh, we're going to drive change by rewarding exemplars. Uh, so you know, in 2025, 20, uh, if you don't um, hit that 50% reduction, if you don't demonstrate that, will you win an award? That's quite stark. That's how we're going to do it. So, and then obviously, from a policy and legislative point of view, that's where we try and uh, get that level playing field. In terms of upskilling, uh, absolutely critical question. We've just started work. Uh, so I, I'm on a, a joint ARB RBA panel, and our first meeting was last week, and we've actually mapped out um, the key concepts already of um, sustainability for CPD modules for the entire profession, and also we are now starting work with the schools of architecture. ARB are fantastic, I must say, in the RBA. So we set ourselves a deadline of three months. We will rewrite the curriculum for uh, architectural education in the UK. So it's a bit of a challenge, set yourself. Uh, we're hopeful of that. Um, so again, the first thing is the CPD modules. Uh, that's, I'm really kind of pushing that that is done this year. Uh, we're working with um, RBA on that. But also, I'm really inviting an Architects Declare group, and especially Letty. Letty is a fantastic example of where you crowdsource and crowdfund and you crowdwrite uh, fantastic guides. And that can be done really quickly. So I think in terms of uh, an industry challenge, we can start to do that now. Uh, then that's a, it's a twin track process. That's a fast track. Um, the slightly longer scale is, uh, is actually trying to pull all the professions together. But we're trying hard. And I sit on the, uh, the Construction Industry Council's uh, body on that one, where all the, uh, all the professions are coming, coming together. The EDGE are very much a facilitator of that as well. So that is all happening in the background. Um, but we're working closely with uh, SIBSI and iStruct initially. We're trying to get uh, RICS members to come into the party. So if there's any RICS members here, come and chat to me afterwards. Uh, and we need, we need that kind of cost uh, as part of that as well. So it needs to be done now. You're absolutely right. And that's what we're trying to do. My name is Marco from Dresden Summer. And we recognize that the average building in London consumes twice the energy which was calculated during the design phase. So my question would be whether the targets which are defined by RIBA are based on the design calculation or based on the actual performance, which really matters in the end. Yeah, OK. So yeah, we recognize the performance gap. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, we, we had that straight on. So basically, the, our benchmarks and metrics are based on operational in-use targets. Um, so we need to predict that, obviously, in the early stages. And Pacifice um, is actually one example of how you can hit that. Uh, and then it's uh, the SIBC TM54 tool. So that's a tool to predict uh, more accurately the energy use of the building, including small power and plug loads. So that's what we're pre uh, proposing. And it's all linked to this kind of mandatory POE at the end of the process. Uh, and that's where we, uh, if that's done, the awards, all that award data that we're asking for is actually, uh, the UCL has kindly uh, said that they will analyze the data of this year's awards. We will then be tracking that. And that's actually our contribution to, the, uh, to, to understanding that. And I must say that, just say that the um, HOK, obviously we, we've signed up the RBA 2030, but also the AIA 2030. And I've just gone through the data of our reporting, annual reporting for AIA. And so that is now happening in the States every year. And all the, all the architecture firms are, are going to contribute that. We need that here. And that's what we're working on with the RBA to, to set up that. So thanks. I think there's a question down here. Simon Foxall, um, the architect's practice and the edge. Um, thank you, Gary, for that. You mentioned a couple of times the word mandatory. And you said the stick. <laughs> um, are the professions going to manage to get there before it becomes um, the law that we actually have to perform? If we compare this to health and safety, um, an another issue of um, great significance um, that we actually did something 
we failed to do anything before we were obliged to. Can we get there first? So that is that is the main question. That is that is the conundrum. Uh, what we can do just now is uh, applaud exemplars, show show what good looks like, and that's what the awards is kind of doing just now. All the guidance is set there. It's uh, it's still kind of recommended and it's best practice. So again, it's all that. Um, and uh, but really, that's and I hope I've convinced the RBA of doing this. Um, uh, but really, we are we have got to move to a mandatory level for chartered architects and chartered practice, and that's in advance. That's that's a differentiation of a professional architect, and hopefully that expands through to other other disciplines. But ultimately, I think it's uh, we've been here many times. In fact, you and I have been working together for for quite a while. Is that um, we need legislation as well. So we do need that. Whether the two come together, I don't know. I'll find out this afternoon when we're at the Committee of Climate Change. Um, but um, I'm a realist as well. But we, we can only do our best. So, Hi, um, Chris Harris from Wood Environment Infrastructure. I just want to flip it on its head a little bit. Um, in infrastructure, you can't build anything now without considering the, the kinds of futures that, that that infrastructure might exist in uh, to the end of the century. Um, and it's impossible to build a new railway or a new road without considering those future conditions. Are the RABA also doing, a, is, is there another initiative going on at the RABA which is looking at that other perspective, the other metric, which is actually can these buildings that we build operate in the kinds of futures that you've talked about in those two or four degrees and, or could they be adapted to them in the future? Yeah, so the, uh, in terms of uh, climate adaption, um, I think in all, all my buildings uh, that I lead, I ask for a future climate model and all that. Uh, so, so every building should be modeled in that future climate. I think that's part of a, a standard SIBSI approach as well. And that's working at a 50% probability of a plus eight degrees temperature increase. So that should be common standard, but I, I don't think it is, that's the point. Um, so in terms of actually uh, our guidance, uh, we recognize that and that we, we've kind of written that into the guidance, but you're absolutely right. We need to sort of look at modeling and future climates. I think the London plan, maybe somebody can write me, I think that includes that sort of uh, future climate. But we need that part of the Partel, and I'm sure we all uh, contribute to the Partel contribution uh, in terms of consultation, uh, but that's the missing link. So I'm thinking everybody around here, it's an absolute glaring error in terms of Partel was not linked to the Committee of Climate Change Reduction and it isn't linked to the exactly as you said in terms of climate adaption. That has got to be changed and hopefully MHCLG are listening to this uh, and will actually change what they're doing. Okay, thanks. Hi Gary, this is uh, Eva Genak from Multiplex Construction. Thank you for this um, great presentation, inspirational I think. Um, I was wondering, in a room uh, primarily, I would say, full of architects um, Why don't... And, and, and others, but through your perspective, and um, I don't, I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on what would you say from the things that you mentioned that are absolutely necessary, it would be the top things or top thing that an architect could do if they want to take it upon themselves to really influence something that they are working on. I understand a number of things would be a matter of, you know, um, client or their whole business um, moving forward on something, but if, if yeah. it was up to that particular person and they wanted to make a difference, what are your thoughts on what are the top things that they could really insist on or investigate? That's such a difficult question. It's like asking what's your favourite song. It's really difficult. Um, but if I was going to say one thing, and it comes back to my, um, my years as a, uh, as a lecturer, um, is actually um, architects especially, this is just for architects in the audience, but actually some engineers as well, is uh, building physics. You've got to understand how uh, the fabric of the building really works. And, uh, and really, that's, that's, that's what it comes down to. But really, um, with that, it's, it's a joint first, is uh, retrofit. That, that key moment, and when a client comes in and you say, okay, what do you want? Do you need a new building? That is the change of attitude that we need. Thanks very much. Thanks. In terms of me being the president of the RIBA and taking forward the agenda for uh, climate emergency, um, what, uh, as uh, chair of board and uh, chair of the council, 
um, I think uh, I've uh, helped the, the sort of build the momentum. So, for example, when I was, uh, first became president, my first council meeting, I made the point that uh, asked for an indication from council. Did they, uh, were they prepared to take the high road of uh, more expertise and uh, more responsibility and more risk to address the major issues, for example, of climate emergency? Everyone put their hand up. So to me, that uh, is a clear message, and through what I write for the RIBA Journal and every chance I get to speak anywhere, uh, through uh, the media and also through lectures and through the, uh, the press, uh, I really emphasise that point. Th thinking of how uh, government and industry are addressing climate emergency, as president of the RIBA, I believe that uh, much more can be done. Um, I was pleased to see Boris Johnson uh, saying in his first speech when he was uh, made leader of the Conservative Party that uh, he uh, renewed the commitment to um, uh, zero carbon. Uh, but you find, I, I think, uh, the industry, uh, particularly house building, for example, they play one issue against another. So, for example, if you take uh, the housing crisis, the, the volume house builders, I think there are about six that build over 50% of the houses in the UK. They say, if you want us to build houses, you can't ask us to meet higher environmental targets. Uh, and Goldsmith Street, that won the, uh, Gold, uh, the Sterling Prize last year, demonstrated that the difference between average uh, construction and average performance and uh, high performance and, and, and really uh, top-notch design is only 10% of the construction cost. So that's really an, an, an indication that really um, government, you need to um, sort of uh, be much more better informed and just not listen to industry and press hard. And that's what the RIBA is doing, for example, about uh, regulation uh, and, and thermal performance and, and all of those aspects that really have to press the industry to perform much better. Regarding the issue of post-occupancy evaluation and, and uh, really what, what we're talking about is the uh, checking that actually the performance that's talked about at the start is what is delivered. Um, uh, I am an advocate for POE, but I, I believe that really um, there are so many. There's building performance evaluation, there's building performance management. I think really what we have to do is um, set the targets at the start and then follow those targets through as the budgets develop, as the designs develop, uh, through uh, statutory approvals, through uh, design development and through to construction and realisation, and then to check. Uh, and I think that's a really powerful tool. And obviously um, having consultants that actually are there from the start all the way right through to the end. And that's even the message that's coming through from uh, uh, Post Grenfell, that really um, projects uh, need to have the consultants all the way, the same consultants all the way right through to ensure the continuity of thought that gives the buildings and the environments the best chance to perform correctly and also um, that they, there is a responsibility uh, all the way right through. I'm aware that, say, for example, um, in, in the G7, that the uh, UK is the only country that does not protect the role of architects. So when we think of um, that whole thing about actually the performance, that we're there at the start of a project and we're there at the end, and you know and the role of engineers and contractors is, is important, but no other consultant is there right from the start to the, you know, to the end, and that's where I think we have to push hard, um, and I think government uh, understands that point and is uh, moving uh, through to uh, an enhanced um, role for, for architects. The importance of holding uh, uh, chartered architects, remember that uh, it's members of the RIBA who are chartered and their practices. So we have both the code of uh, uh, conduct for uh, individual members, but we've also codes of practice for all the, uh, the chartered practices. And to hold them to the highest levels of, of performance as chartered practices, I think, is really important. We're pushing hard to bring into the fold as many practices as possible. We've already checked that, for example, in the AJ100, uh, over 90% of those practices are chartered um, practices. So the idea of only chartered practices being able to um, apply for RIBA awards is an important thing. And I should add that the chartered practice includes um, uh, commitments in terms of employees, in terms of um, how to provide service at a higher level of service uh, rather than just uh, being a registered architect. So those um, all come together to really uh, demonstrate and hold um, 
uh, architect, chartered architects, not just architects, but chartered architects to the highest standards as we take the high road to 2030 in terms of the challenge and also to 2034 when the RIBA is 200 years old. Well, in terms of the uh, RIBA uh, announcing climate emergency in 2019, I would point to our codes of conduct uh, and codes of practice that for years have indicated uh, a commitment to uh, uh, designing in the most environmentally responsible way possible. So, um, yes, we've declared in 2019 um, and uh, we've also then done the practice challenge of 2030 as well. Um, but to me, uh, I think um, just overall, I sense within, uh, within the industry, addressing climate emergency and, and being green and designing sustainably has been a little bit, um, let's say, Moses sandal and beards and, and, and just sort of very much on the sort of uh, the, um, the, the, the periphery. But really now it's sort of front and centre and it's something that we all have to engage with. So um, there will be, it will be carrots and there will be sticks. Uh, to uh, help um, really sort of bring home. Because I think particularly our sort of uh, our students and our early career architects are really wanting to ha um, contribute to this big issue. Uh, and obviously we, we're facing as, uh, as a profession and, and as an industry a series of challenges and, and emergencies and disasters. There's obviously Grenfell as one disaster, climate emergency is another, but actually there's also housing, there's well-being, belonging, all of those things need well-designed and effective environments. And as my T-shirt says, good design should not cost the earth, both in terms of environmentally, but also in terms of cost. It isn't about money. It's about actually investing on the, um, in the early stages and following those big ideas through to fine detail delivery.